Hey, it's Ben with Lions SRD here. Really quickly, thanks for stopping by. And if you want to catch our other shows here on SportsRadioDetroit.com, like Out of Bounds, the SRD Road Show, Laugh Tracks, Spinning the Wheels, any of our great selections, you easily can. Just go to Apple's iTunes, Spotify, right here on Podbeam. You can go directly to the website, SportsRadioDetroit.com. And basically get all the content you want we just appreciate you stopping by and if you like it give us a good review so other people can find it now lions srd sports radio detroit.com hey, let's go out and leave it all on the field we're gonna start with us we gotta make plays for us to win all you gotta do is do your assignment nothing more Let's go. Playmakers on three. One, two, three. Playmakers. Matthew leads in. He's got it. Wants the throw. Pressure comes up the screen. Got it for Riddick. Riddick at the 15. Riddick 10. Riddick 5. Riddick end zone. Touchdown to Troy Lions. Abdul to Abdullah right side. Got a hole. Abdullah 20. Abdullah 10. Shakes the man at the 8. And dances into the end zone. Touchdown to Troy Lions. The action fake. He's going to throw. Rhodes does. It is picked up by. Coming back the other way off the deflection. Glover Quinn. Back to the house. Seconds left. Bradford's got it on third down. Sets it throws. It is intercepted. Darius Slade's got it at the 30. Slade's at the 25. Matthews got it. Looks right. Throws. Caught. Go take end zone. Touchdown Detroit Lions. Barkley takes the snap. Back to pass. Looks. Look. Rolling. Hit. Still alive. Now he's not going down. Sack. Back outside the 50 yard line. Terry Hyder's got it. Backing up, looking for somewhere to go. Stafford's going to tuck it and run. Stafford at the 5, 3, 2, 4, and so Touchdown to Detroit Lions. Oh, Matthew took it home. Lions, SRD on SportsRadioDetroit.com. Hello and welcome to the latest edition of Lions SRD here on SportsRadioDetroit.com. I'm Ben Salagi, joined with, as always, Marty Stouffer all the way out close to the East Coast but just not close enough in Pittsburgh Pennsylvania. Well, the good old 412. I don't even know this, the uh, area code so thank you for that I appreciate that. The 412 but here's the 411 the Lions suck. I'm sorry. Like after the past two weeks watching them against the Bears, watching them against the Vikings and this, and we're just going to kick down the door and, and go hard after this question. Because I thought the Lions had hope to be a playoff team. After the past two weeks, not only is the loss obviously against the Vikings hurt, but I'm looking at it and I'm like, there's no way this team's a playoff team. Like To me, it, I just don't see it. What did the last two weeks, like after you've been watching the Lions, Lions against the Bears where Trubisky looked like the much better quarterback for an entire quarter, almost a quarter and a half. And then obviously Case Keenum, who's having just still this miraculous season. What's been your take from the last two weeks? Because for me, that's that's my take. The Lions are not a playoff team in any way, shape, or form. My take is the fact that I did not realize, and, and this is just this is just my own take, did not realize how much we need Haloti Nada. Yeah. We, we, without Haloti Nada, we went from being – what number top five against the run to now we're somewhere near the bottom and that's in a span of weeks mm-hmm. like i didn't realize and, and you don't realize how big of a presence he is because he doesn't get the stats and that's that's one of the things about about stats that are that's really um misleading like you don't realize a guy's level of importance because he doesn't get all these like oh well hello Dinata didn't get 60 tackles this year no you're right he didn't but he clogged lanes forcing whatever running back to go this way and you know that shut it down so like realizing that outside of Ashawn Robinson we do not have a defensive tackle that that is worth his weight and salt like they're just they're just not good if there's no pass rush uh, outside of Zettel and he's been getting contained it, it's just it's it's abysmal uh, Jared Davis who I think is outstanding he has looked completely lost and i think that's also because hello not is not there it's just the, the defense has gone completely in the drain uh they're just 
it's bad because Case Keenum, and I will go to my grave saying this, is not that good of a quarterback. But he has looked like a world beater the past three meetings against us. He torched us with the Rams. Mm-hmm. He's, he kicked our teeth in this week, and he wasn't even terrible in the first game when he when he played against us. So I mean, it was just it. Uh, it, it was it was ugly. It's it's really really bad. Yeah, and and here's the funny thing too, because this is the second time in four years where the Lions had a great opportunity to overtake this division. Even last year, after winning on Thanksgiving, who was first in the NFC North? It was Detroit because Green Bay, even with Aaron Rodgers, was struggling. So, like, it's it's something that. Again, like in 2013, all the all the cards were starting to fall like, you know, Detroit's way. Rodgers was hurt. The Vikings weren't really good. The Bears weren't really that good. You could sneak in to the playoffs, maybe even hang a banner that says NFC North Champions. And this year same thing, except the Packers aren't really dropping games because for whatever reason, Brett Hundley is still Barely, just by the slimmest of margins, I'm talking millimeters, keeping his head above water. I mean, what he did on Sunday night against the Steelers was nothing short of impressive. The fact that the Steelers needed a last-second field goal to beat the Packers was insane. In the rare defense of the Steelers that I will make, you know, when they lost Joe Hayden, they lost a really good corner cover, and that secondary just hasn't looked the same without Hayden. That No, that's that's completely fair and then but like I was gonna say you also have guys like Case Keenum you know just bawling out having literally a career year and there's not and it seems like there's just nothing you could do from a Detroit perspective to have any constant hope and I mean as you said Haloe not is gone I mean right when he was put on IR after week five that's when that's when the tumbling and stumbling began to fall but there's another major roadblock for this team it's the entire nfc south atlanta decided to finally be atlanta they're looking good you lost to them on controversy which sucks because you can always go back to that game and there was an instance i believe it was two weeks ago because it was after we recorded lions were and it was the thursday night game I lost my mind because I think it was Aguilar of Philadelphia. He got a touchdown. It was ruled a touchdown because he was still in the process of completing the catch. Exact same similar play Golden Tate had in week three. And obviously we know what happened. It was a loss. You look back at that. The reason why it still chaps my behind to no end is because of what the NFC South is doing. The Saints, now with Alvin Kamara, look really, really good, and it hurts on a double-edged sword because people are like, wow, Alvin Kamara could actually be wearing the Honolulu blue and silver. Like, so that hurts. But also, you lost to the Saints, even when you were giving them a run for their money in the fourth quarter on the road. And then, obviously, with the Saints, Panthers, and Falcons, all basically being a huge roadblock because you lost to all three of them, and also, they all have very similar records, and they're above you to get into the playoffs. So that's why all those losses hurt even more with five games to play. So, yeah, just going back to it, it's just that's what I've learned the last two weeks. And something that I've also learned, I guess, if, if we're going to go with this mantra for a little bit further, is maybe just how far away the Lions truly are to being a team that's a contender. Granted, we learned this lesson last year as well. Because like I said, after Thanksgiving, the Lions were atop the NFC North, literally at one point, second in the entire NFC Conference before backing their way into the playoffs with consecutive losses at the Giants and at the final game at Ford Field against the Packers. So that hurt. But you look at these measuring stick tests, like that final game at Ford Field, which if you did win you still would have won the NFC North. You look at a measuring stick game like Thanksgiving. You haven't won five straight Thanksgiving since the 1950s. You had an opportunity to make a statement. You could plant your flag 
and maybe now instead of just being a cute team on the fringe, you can finally say, "Hey, we're not that cute team anymore. We're actually we're we're actually here to play, guys." And what do you do? You give up. It, you give up thirteen straight points in the first quarter to Minnesota. You have a running back who can't get a single simple quarterback running back handoff exchange that leads to a fumble. Like it's just it just baffles me. And also Matthew Stafford, while he did have a really good game statistically against the Vikings, was overthrowing wide open targets. And this is the highest paid guy in the league, which it was we all know was gonna happen and needs to happen. I don't need to have this argument again as I as I rant, but he also looked bad for a quarter and a half, almost basically the entire half in Chicago on the road. So, like, it's just, again, it just goes to show for me at least, Marty, how how far away this team truly is to just being not just in the playoff talk, because being in the talk's nice, being in the conversation's great, but that's all it is right now because this team hasn't shown anything else. They they don't get off good starts. They get buried, and sure enough, in the fourth quarter, it's the same thing. The Lions are always down by a touchdown, or they're down 10 points, and you know we get that old rope-a-dope. They come back, they get close, and then, yeah, you know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, but that shouldn't happen. So, that I mean, that's just, that's just my thoughts on it. I don't think they're really that close to being just outside of the conversation, actually being a fixture for the playoffs for maybe even a year or two. And it's really starting to make me question this contract extension even more. I mean, really this contract extension with Jim Caldwell just looks like a complete and utter disaster with, as we get later on the season, even though you look at the stats, he actually has a winning record in November and December, but I've ranted for a little bit. Now it's your turn. I, I, I will stand by Caldwell. Uh, we all know my feelings. of If you listened to this podcast before, you know I wasn't that high on him. But right now, I, I got to stick with him. You know, we've talked about it before. You look around the coaching landscape. Dude, there's nobody there. There is nobody there. You're, they're not going to go out and sign Jim Harbaugh to turn him around. No. They're, they're not going to go out there. They're not going to sign John Gruden. They're not going to get Cower. They're not going to get anybody. There's nobody around. They're not going to bring up somebody from college. You have to stay, with, stay the course with Caldwell. Now, he is very, very maddening at times, and a lot of his, a lot of like, like some of his personnel decisions just absolutely drive me nuts. I, I don't, I won't even get into that because we've done that before. But th- yeah, you're right. This team, this team's real close to being, on, in my opinion, out of the conversation because yeah. they just they get it together. I mean, it, at least when the Stafford was struggling in the beginning of the season at times, you at least had the defense to bail him out. You knew Killebrew or Slay or uh, Robinson or whatever, Davis even, you knew somebody was going to make a big play and turn the game around. You don't have that right now. You, you can't You can't stop a running back to save your life. Mm-hmm. God knows why. I mean, you just there, there's just there's no hope right now on the defense. So once again, it falls on Stafford's shoulders. And, you know, that's that's all too familiar. But he's, he can't do everything. And I, I, I'm sick and tired of the game. I mean, granted, the fact that he's getting paid $27 million a year, yeah, he, you know, it's going to come back to his shoulders. But I, even Brady needs help at times. You know, it's just you can't rely on one guy to do everything. And it's it, it's the the storyline's getting old. It's just uh, it's time to, to I, I don't know something's got to change. I, I don't I don't know what that could be, but I, I'll stand with Caldwell because there's there's just nobody out there right now. Well, there's Greg Schiano. I hear he I hear he's available. But no, nah. stop it. <laughs> I, I just, <laughs> you are not you are not in the mood to have any fun. No, that's fine. No, but uh, I mean, I, I I don't know what it is because I mean you're right. There really isn't a better option. I mean, you could always go back to the Josh McDaniels, you know, linking with Bob Quinn and the Patriots. I mean, that's always going to be out there. But it's just I don't know. It's just something that. I think that's the most frustrating thing about this franchise and about this team is you're always so close, but then they keep moving the goalposts further away from you just bit yep. by bit by bit. Like you think, okay, you have a good wide receiving core. You do. You have a, you have a good quarterback. 
but yet you don't have a running back. You finally have all of your starting five offensive linemen that you handpicked to be your offensive linemen. Are they really getting the job done yet? No, they're not. Not by any stretch of the imagination. It's just grant. It's just all these little things, like you even said, Halloinata on defense. This defense was good. They were turning over the football. They were, they were being this top five defense that they're still in in some categories for the impressive start to the season that they had, and rightfully so. But yeah, then you lose Halloinata. Then you know, he, he, then everything just starts to fall by the wayside. Anthony Zadell gets. You know, he has a great start to the year, and then he gets kind of lost behind because you don't have Haloe Nada and you don't have an opposite pass rush because Ziggy, Ziggy Ansa is not 100%. He's not healthy, and he's never going to, I don't think he's going to be healthy the rest of the year. And it's becoming a question with Ansa is would you even bring him back? Because he can't, because he's no. shown, well, I mean, I wouldn't either because he's shown <laughs> the last two years. I, sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut you off there, but no, no. I, I'm I'm so sick of the Ziggy Ansa storyline too. Like, right. yeah, he was outstanding his first year or two. That was great. I mean, they couldn't nobody he, no, nobody could stop him, and that's great. But he can't stay healthy. We don't know we don't know what to expect out of him. I I think it's just time to end that experiment. I'm so oh, I'm so damn sick of this Ziggy Ansa. Yeah, no, I'm I. Pff. I, I don't blame you either. I, 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 I really don't. It's it's just it's something that like you look at all of this you know, all over again because are are the Lions in the need of a top pass rusher? They are. You know, are they in the need of um you know, a good defensive tackle again? Well they are. And you look through some of the names early in free agency and in, in drafts, and you're like, yeah, you know, okay, maybe. But I don't know. At least one bright spot the past couple of weeks has been Marvin Jones through and through. I mean, a couple of the catches he made, especially on Thanksgiving, have been nothing short of spectacular, and he was even mentioned on Monday night for the You Got Mossed for both of his catches, the sideline catch and then the – unbelievable double coverage Matthew Stafford I'm just going to throw a prayer and Marvin Jones answers it pulling it down I don't by his fingertips maybe even by his fingernails at that point holding on to the football and scoring so at least that's been a bright spot because I know last year he started out hot and then faded out to oblivion which I know a lot of people would probably be irritated with but he's actually come back which is nice he's actually having a, a, a nice solid year but it's just it's just the things that with five games left you still have teams that are beatable. Like there's I don't think there's any question about that if you know the Lions can win games or not. I mean you have the Ravens, they don't look good. Jameis Winston might be back for the Buccaneers games and you have to beat a Ryan Fitzpatrick no matter what. And right. Then, and then you have the Bears at home, which is another thing that's weird about this team is that this team sucks at home but is really good on the road. <laughs> like that's the thing that's baffling, and the thing that's really baffling about that you have the Ravens on the road, the Buccaneers on the road, and the Bengals on the road. So that's that gets you to nine and seven if you lose to the Bears and to the Packers. So it's just I, I mean I'm I'm not saying that this team is going to be you know, 10 and six, but they should be based on the record. I mean, the Ravens look depleted. You still, I mean, Joe Flacco was, is hurt. There were, they were showing on Monday night football, uh, Ryan Mallett warming up and almost going in because they were uncertain of what was going to happen, you know, in, in that game. So again, you think these games are winnable, but the confidence level is just, it's just not there for me. But I guess the question uh, that I that I have for you, Marty, just looking at it right now, the Lions are six and five. They need a miracle to get back in the NFC North. The Vikings have a three game lead there. What do you think the Lions do in the last five games? Because on paper, worst case scenario, they should go four and one. You know, maybe drop a game. 
to the Packers or maybe to the Bengals. But outside of that, you should at least go four and one on paper. Technically, you should really go five and zero oh because all these games are winnable. What what do you, what are you fully anticipating in in these, in these next five games? Because as the cliche says, this is where rubber hits the road. I think three and two in the next five games is how it's going to go. I think I think they're going to lose to Green Bay, uh, regardless of Aaron Rodgers being back or not. I, yeah, I just you know you were you were talking about Hundley, you know how he's barely treading water. I I, I guess I see it differently. I, I I to me it looks like he's finally becoming comfortable uh, playing. I'm not saying he's looked great. I'm not saying he's you know he's you know, he's going to replace Aaron Rodgers this year. I'm not saying anything like that. But to me he's looked he's looked pretty he's looked pretty decent. Uh, and I just think he's he's due for a, a pretty big win. And that would be a pretty big win to beat Detroit at home, considering how badly we thumped him last time. Not by scoreboard. I mean, just he we made him look well, not we, but they made him look really bad. And they, you know, that's just how it goes. And I don't, and I, you know, I just, man, I don't trust us beating Chicago. I just don't. I, I don't see it happening a second time. I, to me, I think we were lucky to get that win as sad as that is to say mm-hmm. because my god it's just i don't know detroit they just look lost and i just don't see us winning those two division games um tampa bay could be a loss depending if winston plays and if winston doesn't play well, to me that's a win because ryan fitzpatrick is a bum uh, and then you've got the, the ravens who can't pass the ball and you got the, the Bengals who are basically that the detroit lions of the afc they're the most bipolar team in the afc so you just don't know what you're going to get from week to week. You know, they, they can run the ball, but they can't pass it, which is the complete opposite for the Lions. So it's, it's really bizarre. But I think we'll beat Cincinnati. But 3-2 and two is, is the best I see us going. Yeah, and, and just looking at the playoff picture really quick, right now the Lions are the eighth seed, and you still have the Falcons, Panthers, and Saints all in at 4, 5, and 6 in seeds. But they have to cannibalize each other at some point. I mean, they, they do. There's still division games left on the table, so even if a couple of those get a you know two losses and and what have you, that's still there. And also something that the Seahawks are still winning, despite losing you know Sherman and Cam Chancellor in in their secondary. Russell Wilson doesn't have a running game. He is the running game and passing game for the Seahawks, and they're somehow winning. And the answer to that honestly is because. Jimmy Graham is actually feeling like Jimmy Graham again and feels comfortable enough to be himself. But speaking of uh, interesting names, I know, Marty, you're excited for this because he's eligible this week. Josh Gordon is eligible this week. So is the Lions' free, uh, well, waiver wire pick that they picked up, free agent that they picked up, and Dwight Freeney. He's available. Which, out of the two, which are you more excited for? Uh, that's unfair because they both kind of they, they both present different different things. I'm excited for Gordon. I, I guess out of the two, I, w- I would say Gordon because he, it looks like he finally can get his career back on track. It seems like he has his head on right. Uh, Hugh Jackson has even said, you know, he's like this. He, he this is the healthiest this kid has been. And he said, you know, it, it's it's I'm glad to see that, and, and it's just it's a good thing. It, it's it's it, I'm I'm happy for him, and I want to see him go out there and play. They're saying this week he's probably gonna he's gonna be, he's gonna be out there for the majority of their offensive snaps, so yeah. I think Sean Deshaun Kaiser Ben he's got to be salivating right now. He's got a big play weapon who put up a thousand yards and I want to say nine touchdowns with mm-hmm. uh, Johnny Manziel I believe was his quarterback. I might be off on that. I don't know. I was gonna say it was a it was a host of bad Browns quarterbacks. We can we yeah. can we can just agree to that because it right. wasn't good. Right. Uh, but on the on the flip side, I'm excited because Dwight Freeney in the Lions uniform. Yeah, okay, he got let's face it, he got signed on his name and his spin move. But if he can go out there and play at a decent level, not even at a high level, whereas he can command some some attention from that offensive lineman, that'll help Zettel in a huge way. And plus, let's face it, anytime you can sign a, a, a future Hall of Famer, mm-hmm. that's never a that's never a bad thing. Well, that's not true because. The Seahawks and Broncos signed Jerry Rice, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's that's true, but at, at least for this, Dwight Freeney can, and he talked about it when he met with the media. He can, he's he's rarely missed the playoffs. He's and he can bring, 
you know, that intensity, that fire to a team that has still young guys on defense and has young guys on that defensive line. And it's something that, you know, he can, he can share those stories and, and share that expertise. But I'm honest, I'm, I'm, I'm more excited to see Josh Gordon than I am Dwight Freeney. Cause I think Dwight Freeney should just retire and start counting off that five year clock before you go to Canton and wear your gold jacket and, everything like that. Cause for me, Dwight Freeney is a hall of famer, but I'm really excited to see what, and it's what you and I talked about Marty, when you first brought up uh, the story with Josh Gordon, I want to see if he can actually hold it all together. Cause now the bullets are live. All the pressure is real. You're actually stepping out on that field. You can actually play. You can be a key contributor. You can get famous again. You can get, you know, all of this accolades again, and how, and how does he handle it? Hopefully, he handles it all in stride. He, you know, gets, you know, a touchdown because that first touchdown he gets is going to be awesome just to see that reaction. So I'm more intrigued by that. But, you know, as we kind of joked with Greg Schiano being available as a as a head coach, so are two lines. We, we talked about it, uh, the last Lions SRD that we had here on SportsRadioDetroit.com where Jim Bob Cooter was mentioned for the name, you know, possibly being a candidate at Tennessee, which guess what? Since Greg Schiano is not going to be the head coach, he still is a candidate technically, but for the second, well, second or third straight year, to be honest, uh, Austin, the defensive coordinator is in the running for at least Arizona State. And Terrell Austin has been named as a candidate for the Sun Devils job. He's been a candidate. He's been interviewing for jobs in the NFL. And it's something that, you know, there's still some connection there. So who do you think gets a job first? Terrell Austin or JBC? Because I honestly think it's going to be Terrell Austin, in in my opinion. Yeah, I'm I'm right there with you because uh, he, he just he's just more. This is going to sound ludicrous, but he's more consistent than JVC. Like you see, the defense has been not spectacular at all times, but they've been solid pretty much under his reign. Whereas with JVC, we can't run the ball. But we, you know, we haven't been able to run the ball for a long time. Stafford has been up and down this year. It's just there's there's so many question marks. Uh, with, with the offense, I, I have to agree with you. I think it's going to be Terrell Lawson for sure. I mean, I, I don't think he's going to get the Arizona State job. I mean, I, I think he would maybe get an NFL job. But when you have 27 years coaching ex- experience and half of it is at the college level, and he was Urban Meyer's defensive coordinator very briefly at Florida in 2010. So you have all these things going for Austin. And he has a lot of respect, I know, in the league. And he's not obviously going to talk about it, but you have other candidates that are very viable for Arizona State and Tennessee. I mean, you have Kevin Sumlin, who just got let go at Texas A&M. You have Pep Hamilton, uh, passing game coordinator at the University of Michigan. He was an offensive coordinator at Stanford. And also he worked with the Cleveland Browns, so he has both college and pro experience. Vanderbilt's coach, Derek Mason, who is a Phoenix native, is someone Arizona State is having some interest in. So when you just list all of those names, maybe Kevin Sumlin is near the top of that list. But Terrell Austin is not that far behind, at least in my opinion. And that's why I think you know, it's something that he would be a guy out of the two to get a job first because while as good as JBC has been for Matt Stafford and, and you know, for some creativity on offense, I don't think he's ready to be a head coach anywhere for, to be quite honest. And that's why when people were talking about, well, you know, Jim Bob Cooter could be the head coach of the Lions if you get rid of Jim Caldwell. No, he just got the job as offensive coordinator guys like calm down. That you need to have some experience. Yes, Jim Bob Cooter was at Tennessee when Peyton Manning was there, but they were both players. He wasn't a coach. You know, it's just things like that. So, I don't know. Just, again, for me, Terrell Austin kind of gets that nod. 
I would puke in my peanut butter Cheerios if Jim Bob Cooter would get the head coaching job at, for the Lions. I would absolutely barf in my breakfast cereal because I'm not. I'm, I'm just not sold on him, man. I, he just yeah. He he can't get any consistency with that offense. Sure, no. Stafford looks like a diamond, but he's going to because he's a, he's a quarterback coach, and him and Stafford speak the same language. You know what, uh, Jim Bob, fix the damn running game. Then maybe we'll talk about making you a head coach somewhere. I, I just, I, yeah, no, I don't want to see him anywhere near a head coaching job right now. Well, and, and that's the thing, too, because we've talked about it on this, and we've ta- I know we've talked about it on the road show, at least I have, when they when they ask me. But it's it's scheme with the running game. He just has a bad scheme with it. It's not good at all. But there's some interesting quarterback news, and this is the last thing that I have. I don't know if you have anything else, Marty. Maybe I'm stealing one out of your pocket, and if I am, I apologize for nothing because, well, Jimmy Garoppolo is finally going to get a start with the 49ers. It's finally happening. Someone who's not starting for the first time in 210 games. Well, it would be 211. Eli Manning getting benched and not uh, not being able to play. So they're going to go with Geno Smith out in New York, which basically means you've given up entirely. So... Yeah, I mean, just something like when you when you think about what's going on with New York. I mean, they were in, they were interested in Pat Mahomes, and they didn't pull the trigger on him. You know, you have all these things with the Giants, and Eli Manning still beat the Patriots twice in the Super Bowl, so you can't really knock him too much. But I don't know, man. It's just all of that news with coming down for you know playing and who's not playing and right when I right when I saw that Eli Manning was benched I almost fell out of my chair because at this point like why bother going to Geno Smith with five games we know he's a backup and nothing more right like wh- why <laughs> like I don't get that well I don't know I, I if you want to react to it that's fine I, I'm not expecting you to but that news. I, I was actually just have a pretty insane. strong reaction to this because I, I have a soft spot in my heart for for the Giants. Uh, people don't know this because you know, this wasn't a, Twitter wasn't around back then. But you know, I you know, I, I do a lot of social media and it's all lines and stuff like that. But I I cheer for the Giants for a friend of mine that had passed away. He was fifty something years old when he died. He died of pancreatic cancer, and he was from New Jersey. So he born and raised a Giants fan. And he and I grew real close. So when he passed away, I kind of picked up his banner, and I, and I cheer for them every year. If it can't be the Lions, I want it to be the Giants. So I was actually really pissed. And I know I don't normally talk like that on this show, but I was pissed when I saw that he's getting benched because, and you know, Eli Manning, while he's not been very good this year, he's also not the problem. The, you know, they have the same problems the Lions have. They can't run the ball. Their defense has not been good, even though they've paid $11 billion to five players. Eli Manning's not the problem. And, and, you know, I understand that everybody makes fun of his boo-boo face and, you know, everything like that. I get it. And and it's the cool thing to do to make fun of Eli Manning. He's not the problem. I mean, you figure he lost arguably the best receiver in the game. And I say arguably because there's always Antonio Brown there and they they can kind of go back and forth. He lost Brandon Marshall, who wasn't doing anything when he was healthy, but still, you know in time they were going to gel. It, you know, it's just – he lost so many weapons. He has no running game. He's got a patchwork offensive line. He's not the problem. I, to me, this just screams a McAdoo putting his hands in the air and saying, you know what, I give up. I, I don't know what else to do. So he's just throwing darts at the wall and hoping something sticks. And it's not going to be Geno Smith. I, I don't care what anybody says. There's a reason that guy flamed out with the Jets, and it's not just because of the talent surrounding him. It's because he's garbage. You know, he's just he, – he doesn't – I forget who it was. I read when he got released. I, I, I want to say it was Mayock, but I'm probably wrong. But anyway, somebody went out there and said that the, when he left the Jets, he still did not know how to read a defense. Still. And he was there four years. Still couldn't read a defense. The most basic things that, that trained quarterbacks should be able to do, at least on a fundamental level or a base level, he still couldn't do, and he had been in the league four years. Mm-hmm. So I, what McAdoosh is, is thinking, I, I just I don't get it. I, I don't understand it. Like, this, this is not going to help you save your job. It's not going to help you 
win games. It might help you win a game because the defense is probably laughing at them. It's just to me, it's just it, it's unfathomable, and I, I don't get it. I mean, you you can see people like Sean O'Hara, uh, Plexico Burris, Antonio Pierce, all these people just reacting with just such shock and and disgust, really, on social media. It's just it's it's disgusting. I, I don't. It doesn't. It, like you said, man. It just says he quits, and I personally, I think he's just trying to get fired. Maybe. I mean, it's. It's entirely possible because when you put in, and I call him slow eyes, Geno Smith, because he's a one read quarterback and he doesn't read anything else. But uh, once you're relying on him, you're basically giving up with five games to play. And at at this point, you're probably tanking to go and see if maybe you can execute a quick trade to get up higher, you know, than the 49ers to get a Sam Darnold or Josh Rosen or you know, what have you, but you still have the Browns there too, who even though they have Deshaun Kaiser, they still might take a quarterback, which to me is stupid, but that's still that. But outside of that, like I said, unless I picked your pocket, which for which I do apologize, is there anything else you want to, you want a quick hit or cause no, I was, I was just going to say, wouldn't, wouldn't the, the Browns drafting another quarterback with Deshaun Kaiser and Cody Kessler on the roster, wouldn't that be the most Browns thing ever to do though? Hey, we're gonna have fifteen quarterbacks on our roster and not commit to any of them. Well, especially yeah. after the guys they wanted allegedly, but didn't go after like Carson Wentz and Derek Carr, and now all of a sudden now they're just gonna pick quarterbacks until they get it right again. Right. They yeah. were and they were tied to Bridgewater as well, which yeah. On a personal level, I would have loved because I you know, could see him more times a year. But I'm in the same breath. I'm glad he didn't go to Cleveland because he'd probably be out of the league by now. <laughs> well, with the way Case Keenum's playing. Bridgewater's right. active in the off season. You never know. It it might be a viable option, and who knows? I I might be uh, clipping that when we have to break that news. But yeah, that would be I don't know. That would be kind of crazy, but not as crazy as what Chuck Pagano said on Monday during his press conference with that whole Groundhog Day thing, which is really funny because I know for a fact he he had to have watched Groundhog Day on um, Stars because. On my cable provider, and I can only assume he has the same one, even though he's rich enough, he doesn't really need to skimp on his cable packages. But Stars had Groundhog Day airing at 12 o'clock in the morning. So I recorded it because my cable provider allows on Thanksgiving weekend, you know, free viewership weekend, you know, all the premium channels are free to entice you to buy them. So I'm, I'm, you know, busy filling up my DVR with these movies. For example, I think it's the movie channel, which I think star owns or whatever. They had all the Indiana Jones movies, which I own on VHS, but I've never owned on DVD. And I don't have like a digital copy of for listeners, VHS or video cassettes. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Actual (laughs) for for, for our young listeners. I was gonna say our actual tapes. So what I'm doing, of course, I'm like, Oh my God, you know, Raiders, sweet, record, <gasps> you know, Temple of Duke, record, <gasps> Last Crusade, and then like, yeah, like, like, my eyes just lit up. But anywho, back to the whole Chuck Pagano thing really quick. I know for a fact he could not either sleep or he just woke up and had to go to work in his office or something because I know that Groundhog Day was on on Saturday, well, Saturday night, Sunday morning. So anyone who thinks that those references were kind of out of this world – Nope. He probably watched it. I guarantee you. That's what he did, and that's why he referenced it. So it's not that crazy. But nothing really to add for this week's Lions SRD. We will be back. Oh, actually, yeah, one thing. Do you think the Lions win on Sunday against the Ravens? I'm going to say yes. Uh, I'm a big Flacco guy. I, I, he, he won me over with his Super Bowl performance in that playoff run. I I love Flacco. I want to see him do well, but he can he can start to right the ship after this game. Uh, I I just see us I, I see us in his face quite a bit uh, with Freeney and Zettel and, and even potentially Killebrew if, if he's not playing safety at all times, you know, by playing coverage rather, because um, we did lose uh, Tavon Wilson. He's done. So I think that uh, yeah. I, I think we win Sunday. I, I do. I just I don't have much faith in in Baltimore's passing game, their receivers. 
I, I just don't. You know, when you're when one of your leading receivers or quote unquote best receivers is 85 year old Ben Watson, I just you know. I have no faith in their passing game, and that hurts to say because, like I said, I like Flacco. But yeah, I see us getting a win. I'm going to say 27-13. I won't give a score prediction. I'll keep it short and sweet. If the Lions don't win, then the next Lions SRD is going to be me having a conniption. So, because <laughs> at this point, like I said, every game is winnable, and you should win. Like I'm, I'm sorry if you want to put a statement, you have to go five and zero. And I, I would be pissed if the Lions went three and two. But like I said, that's all you the should- time. What? Go ahead. What? Me too. I'm right there with you. Yeah, I, but you I think predicted the five. Yeah, you predicted yeah. I it. did. I did because that's what I think will happen. But man, that's they. They should go five and zero. Oh, but I just don't see it. <sighs> yeah. Well, like I said, anything short of four and one, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna be mad. But like I said, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much for listening. We will be back. Hopefully, talking about a Lions win and seeing if Jalen Tabor actually gets more playing time because the playing time he did have on Thanksgiving, not that great. But that's it. Marty, what do we say to the people? And we say good night. Good night.